So this session is being recorded like always. Thank you for joining. We've got some uh, great topics today. The first one is on adding AWS Neptune support to Amundsen and um, Andrew from SeatGeek is gonna be sharing more about that. After that, we have uh, ML feature discovery with uh, Feast and Amundsen and Marius from Get In Data is gonna be chatting with that. This is based on a blog post that was shared in the community uh, pretty recently as well. And lastly, uh, we are making progress on lineage. So we have one stage of uh, the first stage of lineage is in development and the second stage uh, lineage, uh, we have some RFCs in progress that Verdan from Stemma is going to share more about. Uh, feel free to ask questions during this time. That's highly encouraged. And if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll, I'll pass the baton to you to ask your question towards the end of the talk. Cool. With that, I'm going to pass it on to Andrew to share more about AWS support in Neptune. Hey, let me give myself just get it set up. All right. Cool. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Cool. Let me present. Awesome. Uh, my name is Andrew Sam Brown. I am a data platform engineer at SeatGeek. Uh, I, Suki is a ticketing company, and I'm going to be talking today about integrating Amazon's data builder with Neptune. Uh, just to give a quick overview, uh, I'm going to start to talk about uh, Seekeek and Amazon, uh, give the design of the objectives I had while designing the integration with Amazon, uh, talk about the implementation details, and then finally get to the future work. Uh, just like many of you, Seekeek had a problem. Um, as our team grew and our company grew, our data also grew. And then we started having problems sharing our data and like what table goes with what table and how they interact with each other. Uh, so we started looking at software solutions, uh, came upon Amazon and it really filled out most of our check boxes. Um, but we had one problem and that was that uh, the backend was uh, Neo4j. Uh, and our infrastructure team was not a big fan of Neo4j. Uh, they did not really want to host it within our infra our, our ecosystem, it really was a operation software. Uh, so we started to look at like the managed version of the E4J, but we found that was a expensive use case for us. Um, and it was around this time that we saw that the Square team was actually working on the um, Gremlin implementation uh, of metadata proxy. Uh, and this really opened up a lot of doors for us because uh, then we can use Amazon Neptune. Um, just like to hold on real second. Uh, I really want to say thank you to the Square team uh, for building a very solid, solid implementation here and made integrating the data builder with um, Neptune really easy. Um, if you did not see the video last August, Josh gave a presentation. Uh, it was really informative and really useful. Uh, getting back to it, Neptune uh, was a cheaper for our use case. It was highly scalable and it fit in with an, our uh, other AWS systems. So our infra team would not have any problems with use, us using it. Uh, since about August, we've had great success with Amundsen. Uh, it's rolled out around August 1st. Um, we're using the Neptune integration. Uh, everyone who has access to our data warehouse has access to uh, Amundsen. Um, it, it's nice to see that like people stop asking questions about how these tables work together and all that. And are now just pass around links to Amundsen, which is really great. It's been useful as our at our company. Um, yeah, you know, switching gears a little bit, I'm going to talk about the design objectives I had um, really quickly. Uh, I gave it best effort here to maintain the existing library. Um, I use a lot of open source, and I really hate when I upgrade the uh, open source library and a lot of the components change. Uh, so I try to with best effort here to limit the number of API changes that we're uh, currently using for people who are currently using the data builder. Uh, I only changed components where it made sense. For example, I changed uh, the Neo4j Elasticsearch uh, updated that to just Elasticsearch updated that, uh, just so that we could sit there and say, like, since Neptune and Elastic, uh, Neo4j are using it, so that is less confusion for developer, developers in the future. Next, so I just want, really wanted to keep the uh, existing drop structure I feel like this is the perfect level of extraction here. Uh, you can customize it as you want. Uh, I built personally built my own merge task so that I can have multiple sources of data come into together. Um, and I felt like that was a really useful thing to have for the Neptune integration. 
plus it fit perfectly when you looked at it from above. Uh, and finally, I wanted it to be compatible with the existing extractors and models. I feel like those are a community effort and it would be a great loss if those were not uh, compatible with each other. Uh, and finally, I did not want to limit the Neo4j implementation. I wanted this to be seen as Neptune uh, reaching feature parity with Neo4j, not uh, Neo4j reaching feature parity with Neptune. Uh, fortunately, there has been no no uh, major divide there. Uh, it's no problem so far, uh, but it did, I did keep that in mind. Uh, not to get to the actual implementation. Um, back when I first started working on this, I, the data builder was tightly coupled with Neo4j, which makes sense because it was the only uh, database it was supporting. Uh, and if you're not familiar with how the data builder works, uh, basically you have these extractors that produce these models and these models produce these dictionaries. Well, they used to produce these dictionaries with Neo4j attributes. And you have this FS uh, Neo4j CSV loader that consumes these dictionaries, which then produces these uh, CSVs for the publisher. Um, and if you look, you'll see that it's really tightly wound with Neo4j all the way up to the models. Uh, so there needed to be some kind of like level of data abstraction here. Uh, and this is where I came out with the graph nodes and graph relationships. Uh, basically just a structure here that just generic structure of graph nodes and graph relationships that were produced by these models. This is also right around when uh, we started to type up the uh, data builder. So kind of follow along with the idea of having types throughout the data builder for easy uh, uh, inter interactions and implementation. Um, and now you also see that instead of just going strictly to CSVs, you also have to interact with a serializer. Um, so this also introduced the idea that uh, you'll have to have a serializer to convert these graph nodes and graph relationships to be these dictionaries that originally were being published out. Um, and this is great, I think, for the long term of the data builder project because this allows you to support multiple versions of a database if there one newer version is not compatible with the past versions. And also it allows us to support Neptune. Uh, I see RDS is being developed upon. Uh, so it allows uh, the Amazon community to have the ability to support different uh, backends, which is really cool. Uh, and after that was out, I started working on the actual Neptune integration. Um, this is really simply into three larger parts. You have the components to get data into Neptune and then you have the components to pull Neptune from Neptune to sync up the Elasticsearch engine. And then finally a task to delete the older data. Uh, really the getting data into Neptune is the most interesting part here. Uh, you have two components here, the FS Neptune CSV loader and the Neptune CSV publisher. Uh, the FS Neptune CSV loader is interesting because it just uses the uh, Neptune serializer, uh, converts these graph nodes and graph relationships in, for the format for the bulk loader, which I'll get to in a second. And then you have the CSV publisher, which interacts with S3 and the bulk loader API. Uh, Square and I, well, I think we did it separately, uh, looked at like using a Gremlin client to actually do upserts for these models in like entities. Uh, found that it was not it was very difficult to get performance for larger amounts of data. Um, part of Neptune's API is actually that you can support uh, this bulk loader API. Uh, and it's pretty cool. You can configure it to sit there and do upserts uh, pending. Uh, you can configure the parallelism so that if you're doing larger amounts of data and you don't care about the read side of it, you can just parallelize that up as much as you want. Um, it's extremely, extremely fast, it really works really well for us. Uh, and, that, and that's what's being used inside of the CSV publisher. Uh, moving on to synchronizing the Elasticsearch with Neptune. Um, very similar to the Neo4j variant, uh, supports models of users, tables, and dashboards. Uh, this is where I was really happy about how I didn't like recreate the wheel here with the task. Uh, so now you can use all of the existing Elasticsearch components, uh, like the loader and the uh, publisher. It's really nice and useful. And then finally, just for completion, we do also have the uh, Neptune CMS task removal, which is very similar to the Neo4j variant, uh, just removes the older data as we know, data changes. So you wanna keep your uh, Amazon application up to date with the, most late, the latest uh, metadata. Uh, talking about future work, um, I truly believe that like the data builder is close to feature complete. You could do uh, more or less some refactoring for sure. There's probably a couple of bugs left. 
Um, but in terms of data, is the way it's designed is that any new models that come out, it should be supported automatically, which is really useful. Uh, unless we add another aggregate group like uh, the table or user, then we have to support the search library. Um, but more, most of the work in the future is going to be is around your the metadata proxy and the uh, documentation, of course. Uh, so unfortunately, just like we all know, like it makes sense that the metadata proxy is going to need a constant support as new features are developed. Uh, Neo4j is going to get the the first support, and then Neptune is probably going to have to lag behind. Um, unless we build some kind of like uh, policy in place. Um, and then finally documentation. I wrote a really nice long document. I think it's on the Amundsen main uh, repo, uh, but of course I was just working with my eyes. So there's probably some gaps in there that probably could be used for, uh, be updated. Uh, so if you are looking into using Amundsen with Neptune, uh, look at a doc, let me know if you have any problems with it and we can get updated. Uh, all right, any questions? Thank you, Andrew. Questions from the folks? Cool, Madison, Madison saying thank you. <laughs> yeah, seems like a lot of work. <laughs> uh, a little bit. Um, um, I'll ask the, the three components that you shared earlier, are all of them committed, including the task to delete um, task data? Or are all of them committed to yes. the project? Cool. Everything is committed to the data builder project. So it was a, like a month ago, a month and a half ago, yeah. Uh, which is great. It's fantastic. Yeah. Well, if there are no questions, I'm really interested if anyone. Uh, has integrated Amundsen with Neptune. Uh, I, of course, would really, I believe that documentation is the most important thing, and I want to make sure that that process is really easy. Uh, so let me know if you have any problems, and we can work together on it. Thanks. We'll do it. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, this was great, and thanks for documenting it all too. And uh, we'll we'll definitely let, let you know as uh, as we try it out. Cool. Last call for questions for Andrew. All right, we'll move on to the next presentation then. So the next one is from Marius who works at Get In Data. And uh, he worked on integrating um, Amundsen with Feast to allow discovery of ML features. So I'll let uh, Marius take it on from here. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, hi all, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I hope you can see my screen uh, already. So as Mark said, I will tell you a bit about how we integrated Feast and Amundsen uh, pretty recently. Uh, I work in Getting Data and one of our clients uh, requested us to install some feature store and we selected Feast. And before I go to the details of the implementation, I will tell you a bit what Feast is. So Feast aims to be a standard uh, feature store implementation. And uh, by feature store, I mean a solution to uh, store features and to like democratize access to features needed to train and serve machine learning models. If you may know, uh, maybe you're aware, you are aware that, well, the, when the data scientists, uh, when they build the models, they need to feed the models with, um, uh, with some features and the models, model is just a function that is then applied on features of the same type. And basically the feature store is the solution to make the features shareable so they can be reused in different models across the organization. And uh, basically it minimizes rework on the uh, data scientist uh, side. Uh, the feature store is different from the classical databases because it has like two data um, processing areas. And you can see it on the screen. Uh, Fist implements it actually very well. You have a batch source, which uh, contains all the data that you want for training. So basically you can, you can imagine that uh, you have all, all the data about all your clients. And the more data you have, the more observations you have, the more accurate your models are. So basically there is one kind of data flow here and it's called offline store in Fist. And this is, uh, this is kind of abstraction on how this data are stored, usually using columnar formats to save uh, space and to make the um, uh, feature extraction faster. And 
this offline store is used to model training, as you can see on the right. On the other hand, on the, on the other hand, on the other side, when you have your models trained and stored somewhere, and then you want to serve them, for example, as a microservices, then you can't really use this batch source. You can't really use this um, uh, columnar data formats because they are really bad at you know querying just one row. So that's why there is a second type of uh, type of flow, second real online store, which is powered by some stream source, usually by Kafka that that pushes the updates uh, to, to to your features to some kind of online key value store. And this is just for serving the same models. And in the middle, we had the feast feature registry that holds information about how the feature uh, are how the features are grouped, how do they look like, what is the what is the format, and how they can be found for training in the batch source and for making the predictions in the in this uh, online stores. So this is feast. The technology is actually really nice. Uh, they are doing a lot of effort to actually make it a kind of standard implementation, and they, they are implementing a lot of uh, really good practices. Uh, so we installed Fist, uh, Fist core component, to be to be precise, on the client side, and then, well, we created some feature tables, and then I wanted to just see them. So how do you browse the feature tables in Fist? You can use SDK. There is SDK in Python, in Java, in Go. So you can, you know, if you're a developer, you can basically get the feature tables, get the features from Fist, get the description, and finally get the data. Uh, or you can use CLI. CLI is based on Python SDK, and basically, you know, if you like these black terminals, you can use the CLI to list the feature tables, to list some values, and so on. And that's all. Uh, there is no other interface to interact with the features. And having in mind that feature store is something that aggregates your the data about your clients, for example, the, the ones that are the most, the most important for you because you build the models on them and you do not have anything else than programmatic access on CLI. This is kind of, this is kind of, there is this kind of gap. There is something missing. Uh, there was some idea to integrate um, the user interface from Fist. This was in the very early version, but they dropped the idea and they put it on the roadmap to create some kind of user interface. But well, we had the Fist already installed. Uh, we could show the client the CLI access, but they wouldn't be happy uh, seeing this. So then I started looking uh, to look for some uh, for some alternatives. And thankfully, I was working with Amundsen some time ago. And I thought, well, why not Amundsen? Why not, why not try it? The UI is just amazing. Uh, maybe we can use it somehow. But there is some problem uh, because, well, Amundsen works well on the, on the databases of, of multiple kinds, but this is not like database. It's like uh, you know, something that glues two databases of different kinds. And basically, it's not like SQL. It's something completely different. But I found a way to map Feast models, Feast uh, data types to uh, Amundsen ones. So starting with the beginning, uh, in Feast you store entities, where entities, for example, your client ID, or subscriber ID, or, or whatever, your domain ID, and features is everything what we know about this entity. So for client, this can be, you know, number of visits on the, the web page in last week, or how much money did the client spend in last month or something like this. And these two values, these have a strict type. So this can be represented as columns, as a classical, uh, you know, SQL columns, let's say. Then we have feature tables. And feature tables are made of entities and features. So they store them both. Uh, and feature tables have some, have some properties on how to access them in the batch source and the stream source. But well, they glue columns, they glue entities and, uh, and uh, features. So maybe they can be represented as, a, as a tables. Then in Fist, the upper layer is the project. And we use project to the differentiate dev, test prod, like environment the data scientist is working on. So I decided to put it as a schema. Uh, then the Fist URL as a cluster, we had one Fist instance. So this was, uh, this was pretty static. And finally, literally Fist as a database. So this is the mapping that I used. And basically it maps every kind of object that we can find in the Fist API site, the, the one that uh, allows us to list features, to Amundsen uh, one. But there was some gap, because Fist offers more. Fist um, uh, 
especially from this for these feature tables. FIST serves a lot of information how to access the feature table for training. So for example, I want these features. How do I access this columnar file from HDFS? How do I know what is the path, what is the format, and so on? FIST knows it. Uh, but there is no place in Amundsen when I could store it. And this is super useful information for, for data scientists. Uh, thankfully, I found a really great uh, blog post. I don't remember the author, but the blog post was actually amazing about programmatic descriptions. And uh, that was it. That, that, this was it. So basically, programmatic description, if you, if you probably know, this is, um, uh, this is a way to add a custom markdown to a table. It, it can be even uh, done in the data builder separately to the table metadata uh, creation. So you can do this anytime. And basically you can put any, any markdown. And this is actually what, uh, what I used in the implementation and I was pretty amazed uh, with the results. So this is the, this is the Amundsen UI that you, all, uh, uh, that you all know. And this is actually showing one of the feature tables, one of the demo feature tables. And uh, starting, starting on the right, the driver ID here is the entity. So this is basically a column. The features, they are just additional columns. They have types. You can see this on the, on the right. The feature table is just a table. And the project, here we have a demo project. This is just the schema. Uh, so basically, it maps pretty well to the interface. It shows all the necessary, all the data uh, necessary for the, for the data scientists to work with this feature table. Uh, but also the programmatic descriptions uh, system. It allowed me to push the data like you see on the left. So information about batch source. Well, I decided to not extract the data from FIST, but to put all the data that FIST serves. So you can see the, the format, the URL, some labels. So when the feature table was created, when it was last updated, this may be super important information when you are browsing the features uh, for your machine learning models to see, for example, if, if, if these are actually up to date and uh, some information about uh, stream source. So basically with these programmatic descriptions, I can expose and basically anything, everything I have on the uh, FIST site, the Amundsen itself. And uh, this is already part of the Amundsen data builder. You can visit uh, the pull request 414 and you can find the extractor there and some samples uh, that may help you with, uh, with the uh, integration. But uh, there is more. Uh, because you know, having Amundsen already in place, installed, uh, I was thinking if I can use other components uh, from, uh, from Amundsen to maybe deliver even more useful information for the data scientists. And it looks like this is, this is pretty much true because well, for, 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 first of all, data scientists, they love statistics. Actually, they only trust the data if they see some statistics number of zeros in some column or the top values or number of nulls. So for this, I just uh, created um, a separate job that when we rebuild the features, it calculates the statistics of every possible column. And I used classic um, Amundsen stable column stats model to push them to Neo4j and finally to show them on the, um, the, on the UI. Second thing, uh, data scientists also trust the data if they see it. So basically, well, they see some metadata, the types, okay, but are, is this true data set? Can I see something? So, well, we have this preview button on, uh, on front end. I think there is, it is, yeah, this is a uh, great out here, but actually I, um, th this can be easily configured to be, to be a clickable one. Uh, so we implemented the preview button in the way that it connects to superset and superset um, does a query on table registered in Hive via Presto, and it shows some sample 100 records or 50 records or 50 records or something like this. So basically, we managed to register feature tables as a Hive tables, and it allowed us to pro provide a um, features preview directly in the Amundsen interface. And the client was just you know amazed uh, that you know that they can so quickly browse the features. Uh, last but not least. Uh, Amundsen's, Amundsen data builder is usually powered by Airflow, but the client, this specific client, they didn't have Airflow, uh, but we installed Kubeflow pipelines for them. And uh, I wanted to try if actually Kubeflow pipelines can be used there. Kubeflow pipelines is just, well, it's also a scheduler 
but this is works natively on Kubernetes. Uh, so it executes the images and the as the containers on Kubernetes cluster. So basically I created a very small pipeline that you know pushes the last update information to Neo4j, extract data from FIST to Neo4j, then a step like uh, something that pushes everything from Neo4j to Elasticsearch, and finally something, uh, some block that if the workflow fails for any reason, then it sends a notification to matter most. And actually uh, it works pretty well. It's uh, quite fast, quite elegant, because uh, for example, when, uh, when I needed to upgrade the FIST uh, version, I only needed to do this in this Docker image and it basically it didn't uh, require any, any additional um, effort uh, if we have this all Dockerized. So yeah, this is this is started this is started every hour on Kubeflow pipelines. But uh, also, you know, if they uh, if the if the data scientists if they um, edit some descriptions of tables or descriptions of features and they want this to be indexed by Elasticsearch, they can just run this on demand. This is this is a kind of uh, nature of Kubeflow pipelines that you have the scheduled pipelines, but you can also run them just trigger them where we fees. And interesting thing uh, that I wasn't aware uh, of uh, when implementing it, that Amundsen and Fist are both part on, of Linux Foundation uh, on um, uh, AI and data area. Amundsen joined, uh, oh, I have a typo here, joined uh, this foundation in August 2020 and Fist in November 2020. So it's uh, kind of interesting that, you know, that there is some connection, that some bridge between these two technologies under the same foundation. Uh, that can be you know, used as some kind of you know, marketing material that this is possible to do things that, you know, that are um, supported by, uh, by same uh, foundation. Yeah, and uh, basically, uh, basically that's all. The code, the code is there, the samples are there. If you'd like to test it, uh, let us know. What do you think about it? Uh, maybe there will be some extensions to this uh, to this system as uh, in getting data, we are going to implement Feast with Amundsen for other clients as well after this one's successful implementation. So probably there will be some, some, extens some extensions and some new features. So uh, yeah, uh, stay tuned and yeah, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Thanks, Marius. Questions? Cool. Well, wow, we're doing very low on questions today. Um, I'll ask while other people uh, raise their hands. If you go to the table detail page, Marius, you have these entities and features. Um, how does a user who's looking at this thing tell what's an entity and what's a feature? Oh, that's a very good question. At this time, this uh, wasn't there in the implementation. Uh, but uh, next implementation, that probably I'm not sure if I push this commit into into the data builder. It uh, shows the entities on the as the programmatic descriptions as well, because well the table the columns model in the table it does not allow us to put anything other there maybe apart from some you know some comment. Uh, so I extended it by adding a label, and one of the labels is actually the list of entities. One feature table can have well one uh, one uh, one column entity, and there could be compound entities. So yeah, so this is actually a very good question because this is important for uh, for data scientists to know. Actually, well, they, they usually they usually know to be frank, to be very frank, because mm -hmm. the entity is usually their domain ID. So mm -hmm. for example, if this is a uh, some website, this can be a client ID. If this is a clinic, this can be a patient ID or something like this. So they usually know based on the name, but uh, yeah, this is, this, is, uh, this is also important for the, for the newcomers to this, for the new data scientists joining the team to know explicitly what this was, yeah, what, 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 what this was. Yeah, another thing to explore here, maybe we, we have these badges now for columns that you can put and that maybe oh. uh, another way to put a badge on the entity column that that's an entity and a, a badge on the features once that it's a feature. Oh, that's great. I wasn't aware. I wasn't aware. So yeah, that's that's great. That's even better than, than putting as a label. Yeah, I will explore this topic. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Uh, Shaheen has a question. Shaheen, you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? 
Uh, hi, hi there. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering about online and offline features. And so um, I noticed here that on the left, you can see there's kind of a batch source and a stream source. Um, I was wondering if there's any other distinctions between features that are available online and offline. Do they get separate pages? Or are they all just um, shown in, one, in the same page with the same information? Yeah, uh, here, well, the, 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 um, uh, the structure of the features, the, the names, the, the types, they are equal between these two. So basically, this is one of the rules in FIST, that you keep the same schema in this batch and in this stream source. So it allows you to then, you know, do a predictions on exactly the same data format that you use for training. So basically, the, the, uh, here, you know, the, the columns there will be the same between these, two, between these two stores for one feature table. But preview, it, in our case, it always hits the batch store. So it doesn't show the current data, but the historical data that we have for training. Thank you. Cool. Other questions? Okay, I'll ask. I'll ask a few more. Uh, was the superset already set up at the client, or did you set it up only to use the preview feature? Um, the setup was already there, but we needed to extend it. Oh, what was the extension? Ah, okay. Uh, the superset has um, was configured to enable logging via LDAP, via Active Directory. And for uh, integration with Amundsen, we needed to create, I don't remember correctly what we did, but we did some kind of hack to bypass this authorization API to allow you know, from one special AP, from, from one special IP to allow accessing um, superset without need to log in with some kind of admin rights that you know that can only uh, but can be rights but only on one database. So we had this superset, but we needed to configure it a bit to make it compatible with this preview feature. Got it. <clears throat> and uh, last question for me was any learnings from running orchestration on Kubeflow for Amundsen, anything you had to change uh, significantly or anything you want to share with the community? Uh, let me think. Um, not, not really. I can, I can show the diagram again. So you can see basically, well, three, these this three boxes on the top, on the top of this diagram. These are actually the crucial ones because they do some data movement. So uh, in this implementation, these are all based on the same Docker image. And in this Docker image, we have just, you know, we use uh, the base Python image, then we install Amundsen with a given version, Amundsen Data Builder, I mean, in a given version, and Feast in the given version. So basically, they all share the same image. Then they also have all the same code. But when these are called, these are calling different applications within the same image. So this allows us also to do something like, you know, if we upgrade a version, then we just put a new version of image that we call feature store refresher. You can see the name on the top. And basically it updates, you know, all the, all the components. So at least we do not have any issue that, you know, that one component is using, I don't know, Neo4j driver in some version and second is using in some other one. So basically we use same image. We have uh, three different scripts for these three uh, different boxes. And this and it basically uh, works pretty well. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Uh, last call for questions for Marius. Seems like that will be it. Thanks so much, Marius. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cool. So next up is an update on lineage. And I'm going to bring on Verdan to share more about that. Verdan from Stemma. Sure. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me? Perfect. Um, so I don't really have a very fancy presentation. So I would simply rely on GitHub for now. Um, let me quickly share my screen. There you go. So before actually moving to the, the RFC, so I would quickly um, summarize the existing RFC or the current implementation that uh, that we're working on, that the folks at Lyft are working on for the lineage. It's basically this RFC, which got merged um, a few days ago, I guess. 
So it has two sections, front end and back end. As you can see, the front end has uh, two different tabs on the table detail page. One is upstream and one is downstream. And the both has the list of uh, list of lineage table for that particular for that particular table. And the backend implementation is pretty much uh, uh, kind of configurable, where you don't really have the implementation natively uh, within the Neo4j or within the Amundsen. Instead, like you have the configuration option where you can configure the third party to third party lineage to like compiler works, and from there you will simply get the endpoint and uh, have all the lineage information available on the front end and the front end simply display the lineage information in terms of um, in 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 this list thing um, same for the columns um, when you click on the column detail thing uh, you would see uh, the downstream column and the upstream column and uh, that was pretty much for the for the stage zero for the lineage um, i have proposed two different rfcs one for the lineage backend implementation and the other one is the graph visualization. Um, I would start with the backend implementation, this one. Um, <clears throat> so it would not really change anything on the front end. Uh, this means that the front end would still remain the same. Um, if today the front end is the list based visualization, we would keep that thing the list based. Uh, no change uh, would be made uh, as a part of this RFC. Instead, the change would be made in two different repositories that would be data builder models and the metadata endpoints. So, <clears throat> so what, we, what do we need to change in the data builder? We already have the table lineage model um, that we can use to actually generate the relationships. We are not really going to make any kind of new nodes or new, um, um, new graph thing um, for the Neo4j. It would only be the relationship of one table with another table. Uh, table lineage model is already there that you can use um, via any of your extractor uh, to extract all the kind of body clocks from the BigQuery or Hive or DBT or these kind of tools. Uh, we are not really going to make any kind of extractor or usage extractor or audit log extractor as part of this RFC. This RFC is only meant to be made like the models for the data builder and the and the metadata endpoints, which would be identical to what we have at the moment, um, that supports the third party. So one thing uh, important to note that we would not really deprecate the third party lineage implementation from this thing. So if you want to have the third party lineage tool, um, you can have that one configured, but if you really want to have the lineage implementation, like the native lineage implementation with the other months, um, then yeah, this is, this is the RFC that you should be looking for because that involves the data builder model that involves the metadata endpoints. So the complete lineage would be available within the Amundsen. So you don't really need to go to the third party tool. That's the, that's the whole purpose of this RFC. Um, the second one, um, uh, which is kind of interesting, um, it's still a work in progress because uh, we need to attach the mocks for this thing. Uh, but yeah, <clears throat> this RFC explains uh, what do we need to do on the front end. This has nothing to do with the metadata or the back end. This would only change uh, the current implementation of the list-based visualization. Is there a specific ordering in which uh, we are working here um, in terms of back end first or the graph based later or the other way around? So uh, the way we designed these RFCs, um, it can be done, uh, the, the work can be done in parallel. It has no, in, no dependencies of one to the other. So anyone can actually pick one or the other ones in any order, no dependencies on any other thing. Got it. Any questions? Um, I wanna share that again, like Radhan said, these mocks were done by Lyft and Lyft has a designer, Noel, who worked on uh, these mocks. I'm not sure if she's in the meeting. Uh, but if there are questions about the design and mocks, we can have Noel come in uh, in the next meeting and share the designs in a, in, uh, in a more granular detail. If you all are interested in that, please comment on the chat. Uh, if there are any questions in the RFCs or feedback on that, please, uh, now would be a good time to ask those. Yep. Cool. Last call for questions. Oh, someone raised their hand. Grant asked a question. Grant, you want to unmute and ask your question? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, hey, Verdon. Um, uh, as part of this implementation for this RFC, where will there, there be the ability to add attributes to uh, to the edges that connect the lineage? Um, for example, you might want to see what is the code that's actually causing this sort of ETL process or ELT process to run? Um, so the only thing that we will be building in the data builder thing for now is the models, uh, which creates the relationship, of course, the attributes of those relationships, uh, those would be there. Um, and the only thing that we will not do as a part of this thing is the actual extractor, the usage extractor or, or the audit logs extractor, or these kind of things from different uh, data sources. Okay, got it. Thank you.